Michigan Wolverines remain undefeated as we welcome in Anthony Bellino. You see him every morning here on BCSN and the X's and Bros show. Anthony, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Mark, as always, it is a pleasure. You know, you can't go 7-0 and until you get to 6-0, and and that's where we get to pick up with my beloved Wolverines. Let's talk a little bit about how they got to 6-0, and a dominant victory over the Minnesota Golden Gophers. As much as you can talk about the 52 points, the defense really was lights out, provided 14 of those points with the two pick sixes, and the Gophers really couldn't do much offensively. You throw in a late touchdown end of the second quarter on an unbelievable catch in the end zone, but that Michigan defense was really an eye-opener on Saturday night. Yeah, the first time that a team in six weeks has been able to score in double figures against Michigan. Here's a fun fact for you. No team has actually got the ball inside the 10 against this team, right? So then when you when you start to really think about that and, and the fact that nobody snapped the ball inside the 10, yeah, it sounds kind of funny to say, uh, but but that is true. Michigan's largest margin of victory since they beat up on Rutgers 52 to nothing back in 2019. I mean, this was a four quarter dominant performance. I could really call it just three quarters because in the fourth, you know, when you're changing quarterbacks and a lot of your personnel, it's another game where you know, your, your ones aren't going to play all four quarters. And the fact that you're doing this in conference play should be pretty eye-opening. You mentioned that great grab uh, there at the end of the second quarter, you know, going into halftime, trying to get a little momentum there for PJ Fleck and company. I mean, it, they come out of the break in that third quarter and they were just, you, you know, at some point, it's not that I feel bad for them, but when you have, you run 13 plays in the third quarter and you have a net of seven yards, Five completions were the fewest Michigan has allowed in a game uh, since Illinois had four back in 2016. You think about the little brown jug in the series now. 77 wins for Michigan against 25 losses and three ties. The last time Minnesota won at home against Michigan for this trophy was back in 1977. Like, it, it's almost preposterous to think about how dominant this rivalry has been. They did it in all three phases. And as you mentioned, that defense being able to put 14 points up on their own. Another game that was never in doubt for the Maize and Blue. So that means the Gophers have never beat Michigan in the Metrodome, and they have yet to beat them in their new stadium, which has been around 10 years at this point as well. So that's a little bit of the dominance the Wolverines have enjoyed with the Little Brown Jug. And I, I think... One of the nice things after the game was to see how much the players care about the Little Brown Jug because, as you just laid out, they have dominated this series, so ho-hum, we win again. That was not the attitude at all after the game. Mikey Sanistro could not contain his glee of hoisting up that Little Brown Jug after the victory. Yeah, I mean, when you think about you know Michigan beating Minnesota on the road on their turf in the land of 10,000 lakes, I mean, Minnesota better call Paul Bunyan and see if he's available at all. 18 consecutive road wins for Michigan in this series, uh, you know, winning 43 out of the last 47. And I didn't know this until Chris Wormley told us uh, on the morning show that they actually got a replica little brown jug. So it is it is very unique that, you know, this trophy game that has been so one sided uh, throughout the, the course. I think they I think they began in 1894, 1892 with Minnesota winning the first two matchups. <laughs> I am appalled by that. Uh, but then the forward pass automobiles. You know, a couple world wars and everything else that took place in between the internet. And here we are, Michigan dominating the rivalry. But I did think it was cool that they got a replica jug uh, that they are able to take with them and put in their trophy cases, you know, and, and be able to remember uh, this game. It is historical, it is meaningful, and it is very important. As you point out, you know, Mike Sane was still being that excited about that trophy. It's when it is important to you and it's not just a ho hum game. You can go out there and take care of business exactly uh, like Michigan wanted to. You think about the way that they put up points. We talked about, you know, their, their 14 points off of the pick sixes. They add a field goal. They had a, a, a touchdown passing. They had four touchdowns on the ground. I mean, they were scoring just about every possible way uh, that you could imagine. And it, it all starts uh, on offense. It all starts with that two-headed monster and that rushing attack. Statistically, you know, we talked about this last week. I saw J.J. McCarthy as a dark horse for Heisman. They were talking a little bit about it. He's not going to have the numbers, but the only number that matters is the win column, right? And they got six of those through six weeks. Things are looking up. You mentioned a two-headed rushing attack. With the emergence of Khalil Mullins, isn't it a three-headed rushing attack or maybe even a, a four-headed the way we saw J.J. McCarthy find his, the nose for the goal line on those two runs? I'm good with JJ running the football in, in that regard. And that's a nice little wrinkle to put on film to make people uh, account for them to perhaps maybe open up something else. How do you know that Khalil Mullins wasn't the second head of that two headed rushing attack? I mean, 
you look at the carries, the way it broke down, Blake Corum had nine for 69 yards in a score. Mullins had eight for 47 yards. And then Donovan Edwards with just four carries for 20 yards. Sure, the yards per carry is up there, but everybody's yards per carry were up there. He did have a couple of receptions, four catches uh, for 25 yards as well. It seems like Mullins has kind of, you know, pulled in. And I do think that the Don is going to get his number called at some point in the season. They're going to have to rely on him and he's going to need to have a big game. But it is very nice to be able to see kind of that next man up in Khalil really come in and shake things up and really make a difference and run very hard at that. Speaking of the next man up, we saw quite a bit of Jack Tuttle at quarterback in that fourth quarter. And perhaps the most animated we saw J.J. McCarthy was after Tuttle led Michigan to a touchdown. Tuttle had a scramble down to the one-yard line, and they punched it in from there. And McCarthy's one of the first guys out on the field to congratulate Tuttle and the, the joy and, to use Jim Harbaugh's phrase, the enthusiasm unknown to mankind from the J.J. McCarthy in that situation. You know, that is so vitally important because it speaks volumes to the culture that has been established in that locker room. And I know that we've talked about this here on this program, you know, about the fact that everyone's got to be unselfish, right? We has to be greater uh, than me. And when everybody is working towards achieving the same goal, when everybody wants to see their teammates, their brothers, that's another term along with culture that gets thrown around a lot and has more meaning when you're winning than it does when you're losing. But when that bond is tight and you know that the guys on the sidelines are rooting for you to be successful, that they want you to get those carries. They want you to make plays on defense. They want you to get into the end zone or make that catch or make that throw. I think that when your peers and the upperclassmen are setting that sort of example, it can really take your program to that next level because that's how the young guys are being raised in this Michigan football program. And when they become an upperclassman, that's how they're going to bring uh, their younger counterparts along you hope. And so it is something that it does take time to build, but when it's there, it's there. It looks legitimate. It looks genuine. Uh, we saw it on Sunday inside Ford field, the same type of deal where guys are excited uh, for their teammates and for their friends, their brothers, to have success and it really goes a long way out there in the football field it's one thing to talk about it it's another thing to be about it speaking of the national football league earlier this week jim harbaugh basically said it sure sounds like a a contract extension is going to happen sooner rather than later that's what the reports are saying will that finally kill the rumors of jim harbaugh leaving michigan for the nfl if he gets a contract extension Absolutely not. He the, the ink could still be wet and they'd be talking, well, you know, this job has really opened up. Oh, they need a I, I don't think that it will ever stop the rumors uh, because I don't think that enough people on the outside know Jim well enough and what he wants. And and I don't I don't even know that hell week to week, he might not even know uh, what he really, you know, wants. But I think that with all the success that they are having at Michigan, going back to your alma mater having that kind of sustained success now gunning for a third consecutive big 10 championship, especially with the way that things are evolving in the college football landscape and knowing that the way that he wants to do things can still win. I think that's very, very important. And I, I just don't, I don't see him leaving personally. And I also don't see those rumors ever stopping for as long as he has a whistle. And even well, after he retires, people will be like, well, you know, Jim Harbaugh is sitting on the couch right now. He might come back to go coach, uh, you know, Minnesota or Jacksonville or, Whoever's in trouble, Carolina, for example. Maybe Jim Harbaugh and Urban Meyer can co-coach Michigan State. Yeah, that Urban Meyer to Michigan State thing is very, very intriguing. I had heard from a pretty reliable source that Urban, you know, did have a conversation with Michigan State last Friday. You know, the validity of that, I trust it. But at the same time, I was a little, a little weary uh, about tweeting it because what exactly does that conversation entail? I think that's too, I think it's too much of a risk for Michigan State and for a lot of the baggage that comes along with Urban Meyer. Yes, he can win. We know that's important. Yes, he can beat Michigan. We know that that is very important. But the optics of it uh, kind of seem a little strange. And from the reports, uh, Bruce Feldman, for example, had said, you know, Urban is very comfortable on television. He likes his role. He likes what he's able to do. And I, I think that might be a good fit for him. Dollars to donuts, I'm willing to bet the conversation between Urban and Michigan State was along the lines of Michigan State called to say, hey, Urban, who do you think we should hire? Not, hey, Urban, should we hire you? More of a, of a consulting type role, but that's why we've got plenty of fodder to talk about. Michigan Wolverines 6-0. and The last three games, they've looked a lot better than the first three games. And granted, Rutgers, Nebraska, and Minnesota aren't necessarily good teams, but they're certainly better than East Carolina, UNLV, and Bowling Green. The way Michigan has 
ratcheted up the intensity as they've gotten into Big Ten play has been impressive. Oh, it really has. I mean, that 52 to 10 game, 45 to 7, those were games that we were talking about on this very program that we wanted to see against East Carolina in UNLV and in Bowling Green, right? And we talked about, okay, it's a little sluggish and the, the stadium doesn't have a lot of juice and where is everybody? And they get into Big Ten play and outside of that blip on the radar, a big play busted coverage from Rutgers. I mean, you talk about point differential. My goodness, they are absolutely dominating. Over 120 points scored against, you know, three Big Ten opponents. That is something that you don't want to shy away from. And I do think it's visible. And when you talk about a football team, right? Individuals get better during the offseason. Teams get better during the season. Urban Meyer said something, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago against uh, as Michigan was traveling to Nebraska. He said, you don't want to be the same team in September that you are in October. And if you are, then you're not a very good football team. And I thought that that was very interesting, speaking of Urban Meyer, uh, because this team looks different right now. And I know it's still sort of like, okay, the competition level just isn't really there. And you're not going to see much difference here from Indiana. But the fact that everybody knows it in this team now is coming out and pummeling people even worse. Uh, the defense continues to stand tall. The offense continues to move the football at will. The offensive line seems like they are a lot more cohesive through six weeks of the season. I think all things are pointing up for Michigan. I usually don't buy the hype, but looking around at the rest of the country, and I know there are some teams that have played some better games, Ohio State, you know, beating Notre Dame, for example, at Notre Dame losing this past week uh, to Louisville. USC needed three overtimes against Arizona. Georgia had a really nice game against Kentucky. They blew their doors off. Kentucky was ranked like 20th in the country. They were undefeated. And Georgia wins by 31, 32 points, what have you. But I can finally say in my heart that, yes, I believe that right now Michigan is the second best team in the country because they can do it in the air. They just don't do it. They, they don't have enough repetitions, right? They're not going to throw it 50 times a game. So if they do get in a bind and they have to pass, you know, that's where I want to see guys like Cornelius Johnson, Roman Wilson, Colson, Loveland, uh, Donovan Edwards out of the backfield, right? They have some weaponry there and they have a quarterback that can really deliver it on time in tight windows that we haven't seen make the same mistakes that he did in week three against Bowling Green. I mean, we talked about can JJ McCarthy bounce back after a dismal performance. I think we could check that box. We have a defense that can get after the quarterback. They can stop the run. They can press on the outside. They're going to need to be able to do that against some of these high caliber wide receivers that they're going to see a little bit later on down the road, like Maryland, Penn state. And of course, Marvin Harrison jr. There at Ohio state special teams has been good. Like I, I finally feel confident in saying that, yes, you know, it's not a Homer pick. I had Michigan as low as eight, in my top 25. I, I, I think they're the second best team in the country as of today. As you alluded to, it's not going to get much more difficult this week with Indiana coming to town. Hoosiers 2-4 and four with their wins over Indiana State. They needed overtime to get past Akron. I suppose this is at the point where we mentioned that Indiana traditionally plays Michigan tough. And Jim Harbaugh's closest margin of victory in his time at Michigan is against Indiana. But this is a bad Hoosiers team. With Tom Allen is probably out the door. They've already had a revolving door at offensive coordinator. This is a, an Indiana team that cannot score points. And they're going to be in trouble on Saturday. Yeah, they are in big, big trouble. I mean, they, 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 you know, their last five, you know, they got beat by Ohio State 23 to three, Indiana State 41 to seven, uh, Louisville 21 to 14. You need four overtimes against Akron to beat them uh, 29 to 27. You lose to Maryland 44 to 17. They just, they, they cannot move the ball very well uh, through the air. Their, their quarterback is, you know, they, they, they have a lot of work to do here. Their lead running back has 212 yards on the season and two touchdowns. Their quarterback's thrown for 662 yards, two touchdowns, and three picks. Like, this should be a boat race. And although, as you mentioned, yes, closest margin of victory, it is very important that people listen to that. And when they read those tweets, they look at margin of victory. That is a important, like, asterisk, you know, star there. Uh, because, yes, we know that there are some other games that get out of hand. Indiana typically does play them tough. I think that this Michigan team is a little bit different from a focus standpoint that this one won't this. Yeah, this is going to be a housing right here. This won't, it won't be close and I'll be, I'll be up in the press box. I might, I might even be done after the first quarter. They might yank me off the field, Mark. They say no more t-shirts. We're done here. Jim Harbaugh loves his dogs, his determined athletes with grit. Well, we love our dog, our determined analyst with grit as Anthony Bellino from the X's and bro show enlightens us every week here in college ball weekly. Dog, thank you. Hey, you know what, Dan Campbell, Jim Harbaugh, Mark Coons, we got a lot of grit here. That's what we got, a lot of grit. Mark, as always, my friend, appreciate the time.